There's some seats up here in the front. Do I need to put on the speaker for the streaming? I mean the... There are chairs up front? Yeah. Probably good idea. Once it's settled down. He said, we're good. Okay. Welcome, everyone. I hope you got some snacks. There's also still, don't worry, will be food afterwards. Um, so I just want to say welcome. Um, my name is Megan McClellan. I'm one of the directors, the core director for the Healthy Development and Early Childhood Core here in the Halley Ford Center. Um, and today, um, we are very honored to have Dr. Todd Little here to present our annual lecture. It's the Duncan and Cynthia Campbell Lecture on Childhood Relationships, Risk, and Resilience. It's made possible by a very generous endowment from Cindy and Duncan Campbell. And so I want to spend a little, and I also want to welcome our um, colleagues and friends who are also joining us um, on the web. So we're excited. And we might have, if they have questions um, from online, we'll be able to capture those in chat and then get those at the end um, of the talk. And if you do have questions, I should just say while I'm on that, um, you can either ask if you have a burning question, you can ask um, Todd so he doesn't mind which way, or you can hold them till the end. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Todd Little. He's a professor and director of the Research Evaluation Measurement and Statistics Program at Texas Tech University, where he is the founding director of the Institute for Measurement, Methodology, Analysis, and Policy. Dr. Little is an internationally renowned a researcher known for his work on research methods. Um, he's very well known for our treatments of missing data, um, multiple developmental processes, um, indicator selection, and also content area in developmental research. He's the editor or co-editor of at least five books related to methodology, including the Oxford Handbook of Quantitative Methods and the Guilford Handbook of Developmental Research Methods. He's the past president of APA's Evaluation, Measurement, and Statistics Division, founder of the internationally renowned and very popular Stats Camp, which is a summer training program, and a fellow in multiple societies. I should also say that's really what's amazingly impressive is that he's given over 150 workshops uh, and talks on methods in, around the world. He's also very well known for his highly collaborative um, research partnerships, and he's published with over 280 people, although last night I think he said 350. <laughs> 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 I, I can barely even remember my own name. That's amazing. <laughs> um, so we're just very honored to have Dr. Little here today, and the title of his talk is Seven Methodological Practices to Improve Research on Risk and Resilience in Children and Youth. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Todd Little. Thanks, everyone, for the invitation to be here. Thank the Campbells, the Holly Ford Center, uh, our dean. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, this is a significant honor for me. I don't know that many of you know for sure. It's an honor. Okay, it says it's on. There we go. Oh, there right. Right. So, again, thanks, everyone. <laughs> Um, so this is a, a significant honor for me because I don't know that many of you realize that uh, one of the reasons I'm wearing orange and black is that uh, I have a legacy here. Um, <clears throat> my father was a football player at Oregon State on scholarship in the 1950s. And not only that, but he is a second generation little to be at Oregon State College at the time. That's my grandfather, Frank, and here's the picture of him from the 1920s in his uh, football stance. He also played at Oregon State on a football, and uh, he was also here on a boxing scholarship. Right. So the illustrious part of all of this is in 1953, <laughs> <laughs> the Beavers beat the Ducks seven to nothing on an intercepted pass, and this right here is Little catching the interception and taking it into the touchdown. So. <laughs> Tommy Little was the one who scored the touchdown. And he's little, and he's my boy. So this is a special honor for me to be here, my first opportunity to be in Corvallis. So to the purpose of my invitation to be here, um, 
As many of you know, Rick and Megan put together a special issue, the Just One Wish a special issue. Much of what I'm going to be talking about today is inspired from the opportunity that I had to contribute uh, a short essay to the One Wish essay. Uh, the title of that uh, paper was Methodological Practices as Matters of Justice, Justification and the Pursuit of Verisimilitude. One of the things about these essays that I found particularly uh, invigorating, it was a no hold barred opportunity for me to say, after 25 years of doing all of this, what really do you want to say? What peeves you the most? And you'll notice I've got the word peeve right up there at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> One of my biggest... <laughs> So one of the things that I've been bothered by the most is constantly hearing from people saying, oh, that's all nice, well and good, but reviewers of this journal would never allow that kind of thing. Or would it get past the review panels? Would, you know, could we ever get these, things, these advances in methodologies? Can we actually use them and get them published? And there's this fear of the uncertainty and the statistical ignorance that kind of permeates there that has been driving me crazy for most of my career. Um, early on, when I started doing structural equation modeling as, uh, as an analytic tool for my research, we would get them rejected routinely, saying, why don't you just do an ANOVA? Why don't you just do a regression? And we would have to write back detailed letters to the editor explaining to them what the advantages of the, uh, of the technique were and why we would, you know, didn't want to go this other route because of the, some of the problems and the assumptions that we couldn't test, etc. And all of those letters to the editor sometimes would actually be longer than the original manuscript. <laughs> right? Many of them I kept and over the years and put them together. And my book, Longitudinal Structural Equation Modeling, is actually comprised of a lot of letters to the editor explaining <laughs> these techniques. <laughs> so for me, uh, the, the title of my essay was uh, On Justice, Justification, and the Pursuit of Verisimilitude. So the first part of this is justice. Social justice in the sense that the work that we do should be informing practice and policy. If we're doing research that's not informing practice and policy, why are you even doing this? Right? So if we want to do this to make a change in people's lives, we want to do it right. We want to do it well. We want to do it so that we can unequivocally start pointing to answers that will change people's lives. Most of the work that is being published in our journals today is still being uh, utilizing techniques that we know are right with problems, many methodological problems. So we need to start pushing ourselves to get better answers to make sure that we are informing justice, right? Because what, uh, what we do will eventually get out there as research is going to change practice and policy, hopefully. So <coughs> methods are not just applied they are justified. And this is one of the things we've had conversations with a few of you about. Many of us learn the, the statistical techniques of, well, here's what you need to do. Here's the technique for this, and here's the technique for that. And what we try to teach now is really teaching you how to think about statistics and how to think about methodology and how to justify the analytic technique that you're bringing to bear on your question, given the kinds of data that you have, given the nature of your research question. All of these things have to come together and say, here's the best methodology that I can utilize for this particular research question because it satisfies this assumption or is not going to be so bad because it violates this assumption. We know that we're robust here. All of those are the things that you need to be thinking about when you choose an analytic technique to apply for your research questions. So I know that you know. so often when we go through our, our training programs, it really does feel like you're given a recipe of how to approach things. Right? What I want to do is I want to create master chefs that can invent new recipes instead of following one by rote. That's the goal here. The other theme of my essay is the pursuit of verisimilitude. Um, verisimilitude is the truth-like value of the work that we do. And I think that when we make this distinction between causality with the lowercase letter c versus causality, the big C, the C word in statistics, causality, and we get so hung up on trying to demonstrate causality that in fact, that approach to causality is the enemy of verisimilitude. 
we're not able to embrace and understand that much of the work that we have does have actionable implications that it does have practical usage regardless of whether it's causality with a capital C it's causality in the 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 truth like value is sufficient for us to make good actionable decisions and inform practice and inform policy especially if we're utilizing some of these newer techniques that can drill through many of those assumptions that have heretofore always been thrown back at you say well you can't say anything because this is a problem and this is a problem and this is a problem well now with some of our modern techniques we can say you know what these are some things that we can address I've done a lot of cross-cultural work in my day one of the things that if you did a cross-cultural study the first thing would say you know that just reach in the drawer pull out the six reasons why you can't publish cross-cultural research because of all of these assumptions you can't test well you know what we can one of the things I'm going to be talking about here in a few minutes is factorial invariance when you can demonstrate factorial invariance of your instrument across cultures you satisfied those those assumptions to make heretical conclusions about differences at the level of the culture and not at the level of something gone awry with my measurement tool okay now the title of my talk is seven practices that will improve research in this area so part of this what I want to talk focus in now for the latter part of my discussion are the things that we can use in our research that I suggest will begin to improve how we do work for that one more slide I want to do. Sorry. Sorry. So one of the themes of this whole idea about the pursuit of verisimilitude and having all of this increase in methodological sophistication is we need to move away from our traditional model of me search to a model of we search. Now, me searchers would be the original models when I was my sole author on a paper. Mean I did my own analyses. I'm my own theoretician, right? Now we start, then we would move to another model where maybe I might team up with a statistician. Well, the statistician just does the statistical side of things, and I do the theoretical side of things, and we don't, we're not dancing together, we're not, we're not doing anything, we're a little bit disjointed. We searchers, on the other hand, can start getting into that transdisciplinarity that we really want. That we have the, the content expert who is methodologically savvy, we have the quantitative person who is theoretically savvy, who can talk to you and understand where your research questions are coming from, work with you to make them more of a testable research hypothesis, so that when you finally come together and you're dancing that tandem, you are going to have an analytic technique that will address the research question that was the burning question in the first place. So creating research teams, I think, is the direction that we, be need, we need to be moving forward, uh, moving toward. But there's always going to be this fundamental problem is that the academic institutions that we work in are built on the model of me-search. Evaluations of, for tenure and promotion are based on me-search outcomes. So we'll, fundamentally, we need to start changing that part, too. So there's some systemic problems that will, that will inhibit us from being able to make this uh, a realized dream of mine. Okay. So among the seven practices... Um, draw up the orange a little bit more. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so the use of latent variables. One of the things that we'll see, and still, I've done reviews of various journals, and you still will see MANOVAs, ANOVAs, regressions on manifest variables. There are a lot of assumptions that are being made about those analysis techniques that are not tested. When you, import, when you incorporate a latent variable approach, those assumptions become tested features of your analysis model. Not only that, they come with a wealth of additional information that can help inform the various aspects of validity of the research that you're wanting to do. Yes, it's harder. Yes, it's more time consuming. But indeed, the results that you get from those analyses when you really worked with them, you can feel confident that what you're presenting forward is going to be satisfying social justice. Right? There are few fewer assumptions being made now that are left untested when you start going into a latent variable approach. 
Um, John Nesserode has a quote that I've been borrowing, attributing him for some years. Indicators are our worldly window into the latent space. So constructs are the things that we want to measure. We think they exist, right? We're, we're, we're attempting to make uh, policy and practice decisions based on something we, in fact, can't measure. But we can get indicators of those constructs. They become our worldly window into that latent space of where the constructs are. And if we just trust that this one thing that I've measured is the construct, that's going to be a problem. That's a leap of faith that I don't think anybody else wants to make. But if I can get multiple indicators of that construct and observe how they begin to triangulate on that thing that I think exists, now I've got corroborating evidence. And now I can be more comfortable in making a determination that that construct is real. And here's what I can say about that construct that will change policy and practice. Okay. Use full feature modeling. You know, a lot of times I see somebody might do a CFA of their measures. And then they say, OK, now I'm going to go do a regression. Or, OK, now I'm going to go do the MANOVA. <coughs> Again, when you after the CFA and you start putting the variables back together again, well, you're not correcting for the measurement error. Right? Uh, you're assuming that all those indicators are equally good indicators. And that's rarely the case in a lot of behavioral social science researches that, that we do. So you want to be able to disentangle the information so that when you're capturing that latent construct, that's the information that you're modeling and making decisions and making statements of generalizability about. Right? So full featured modeling would include utilizing the mean and covariance structures so that you can do things like test for full factorial invariance if you're going across time in an intervention or if you're comparing a control group versus an intervention group that in fact the measurement tool is behaving the same way in both groups so that you can draw more veridical conclusions. You can, you can incorporate on top of these models characteristics for mixture modeling, multi-level modeling. So when you have nested data structures, that they can be easily incorporated as part of the whole system. The tools that we have available can do all of this. I think one of the reasons why we don't see them in practice as much is you know, even prior to maybe 10 years ago, the computers were a little on the slow side. The software packages didn't do the numerical integration quite as efficiently as they do today. So that it was slow and time consuming. And because we weren't well trained in it, we knew enough to be dangerous in terms of programming these things. Part of my mission in my latter part of my life with things like StatsCamp is to bring to you an opportunity to get the post degree training that you need from people like a Catherine Mason to say, you want to do mixture modeling? Well, come to StatsCam because Catherine can teach you what we need to know today. And the tools are there, the software is there, you can utilize them and not make mistakes. All right? But you, you didn't get that in your graduate training. Right? And you're not going to get it on your own sitting down reading because you're too busy. So one of the ways to accomplish that is to create these kind of training opportunities. All right. Number three, focus on measurement. In my view, our reliance on Likert scales is a travesty. <laughs> our great, 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 great academic progenitors used Likert scales. 1931. 1930 was the year that my grandfather helped Oregon State beat Oregon. 1931 was a dead tie. But that's when Likert came up with his paper to talk about <laughs> how to use Likert scaling. And Likert scaling only came about because it was at a time when you're doing paper and pencil type stuff. All that he was able to show is that based to the compared to the number line, which was a valid technique, it was okay. It worked about as well. But it was much more efficient, it was much less error prone. You didn't have to roll get the ruler out and measure where on the number line the person put the magic X. But today with our modern technologies, with our smartphones and our touch screen tablets, I mean, you can get a six pack of Kindles for under 200 bucks now. 
right? Why are we just buying up a bunch of those things and using them in our research with the nice touch screen and put the ruler in there so that respondent can just say, here is my response. We know that they are, for, you need fewer items to get at the same level of reliability and they are more valid. We know that, why are we not using them? And yet we still persist in using Likert scales. Another thing that we haven't really thought through enough in my mind is the actual tool, the scale that I want to utilize. Where did those items come from? Where was the original tool developed that somehow some data were collected, a publication came out on it, and God forbid you should ever touch one of those items here before? <laughs> because it's now a validated tool. You want to know where that thing was invented? At the bar of the main hotel at the conference the preceding year, people got a cocktail napkin out and they started generating a bunch of items and they threw them out at the next day, collected a bunch of data, put together this structure, and now the tool is quote unquote validated. Most thinking people can look at those things and say, mm, I'm not so sure about these items. Where do they come from? And sure enough, if you look at them, those intuitions you have about those items, they're not that good. And are they really helping you get at the construct that you want? Probably not. Some people would argue, well, you've got to have the diversity of the construct space. It's like, you're just throwing in a bunch of muck into this thing, and you're missing the construct. So we can start thinking more deeply about the tools that either we want to develop ourselves or tools that are in place. Modify them and put in your paper, adapted from and you will probably do a better job of getting at the information you wanted to get at in the first place. Moreover, if you use structural equation modeling, point number one, you can demonstrate the validity of your modified version in the CFA model that you're fitting to start asking and answering your questions. So it's part of the process. The validity study is the measurement model of the SEM model that you're fitting to analyze and answer the question in the first place. So you've got it all built into your analytic system when you adopt these modern tools. Another issue that I think is important for us to consider, and this is a quote from Thorndike, you know, that which exists at all, or whatever exists at all, exists in some amount. To know it thoroughly involves knowing its quantity as well as its quality. From my perspective, that was a call on Thorndike's part as a measurement expert, if you've done some qualitative study and you think something exists, then it's my job to figure out a way to measure. Because if it exists at all, it exists in some amount. But we have very few people that are willing to take on that challenge of how can I figure out a way to measure that? Right? The low-hanging fruit has already been tackled. We've got the big five, easy enough. Right? We've, got, we've got these bigger dimensions. But now we're starting to get at more refinements. Well, can I come up with a tool that can adequately get at that nuance that you're after? And does that nuance then add something important to predictive value? You're telling me from your focus groups that it's really important. Well, then it's my job to measure it and demonstrate that it is important at this larger level when we take it to scale, in a sense. And if you look around most training programs, there's very few places where you will be able to sit down and say, here is how you can create new tools. Here are innovative ways that you can measure things that we've never tried before. Maybe this will work. Where's the innovation? So my call to you all, especially the younger ones, is take that creativity and innovate. Think of some interesting ways to measure things. Number four, modern missing data. We did a review even in prevention, prevention science fairly recently. And the number of articles published in the last year in prevention science that used some form of deletion method for handling missing data was still in the 50 to 60% range. Yeah, still. Why are we not utilizing one of the two modern approaches, multiple imputation or full information maximum likelihood? Either of these generally can be utilized to adequately recapture the lost information that typically when, you, when data go missing, they go missing for a reason. And when they go missing for a reason, 
Is there some way that we can get back that lost information? That mechanism is referred to as the missing at random mechanism. It's a misnomer. Because what that means is that after I have controlled four variables on my data set that happen to be correlated with the reasons for why the data went missing, now they're functionally at random and I, ha I can ignore the missing data mechanism. So when people say, oh, we assumed it was missing at random, they're typically thinking MCAR, which is the missing completely at random mechanism, which never happens. Right? Data don't go missing on their own completely at random. <laughs> they go missing for a reason. What we need to be starting to think about is how can I make sure that I have variables on my data set the sole purpose of which is to capture why those data went missing. If that variable is on my data set, I will have a MAR missing data mechanism. I can recover the missing data mechanism process such that my parameter estimates will look like what they should have looked like had I not had missing data. And I will have much better generalizability. If you look at most longitudinal research, that does complete case analyses, still to this day, complete case analyses, deletion, missing. If you missing wave two, you're not in the study. We are as wrong as we possibly can be. That sample is as selective as it could possibly get. By treating it as a modern missing data mechanism, I can get back the original sampling frame that I can generalize back to that population that the original sample was drawn from. The big issues with missing data is recoverability of that process. So when there is a reason for it, can I get it back? The modern approaches will do it. But if and only if the variables that are predictive of the missing data are represented somehow in your analytic tool, either in the missing data imputation using MI or as auxiliary variables if you're using full information maximum likelihood. Because this is the other thing that we found. The a significant number of articles would use FIML estimation. And they would say, well, we're assuming MAR and we're correcting for the missing data mechanism. And no auxiliary variables are used in the data. So that only means that they're making the assumption that the variable that's important for the missing data is also in my analysis model. And the 27 other variables that were on the data set that they didn't include in the analysis model, the assumption is that there's zero correlation of them with the missing data mechanism. And that's not likely. So somehow, if you have other variables on your data set, the recommendation is, the, uh, is to do a full representation of all those auxiliary variables. Put all those other variables that are not in your analysis into what's called the auxiliary block. Ensure that you're capturing that missing data mechanism. Problem with that is, those variables themselves have missing data. And you start getting too many variables in that auxiliary block, and all of a sudden you start losing efficiency. So it actually becomes a power undermining issue. Uh, now, I've banged my head on the wall with this problem for a number of years. Um, John knows about this. He's seen the dent in the wall. <laughs> so we finally came up with a way that you can get these auxiliary variables in an efficient way that you can capture back all the missing data mechanism information that's contained in a data set and still not overwhelm the system. And I'm not going to go into a lot of details on that, but there's a recent paper that uh, Wayland Howard was the first author on that introduced how to use principal component scores to get, grab the component scores from your data set and use those component scores as the auxiliary variables for future imputation, whether it's uh, multiple imputation or using them as auxiliary variables. We've developed a software program called Quark. I let my kids name these programs. <laughs> so there's a, there's a software program that we're developing in the R world called Quark that will automate a lot of this for you. So it'll give you the component scores. And there's a complementary program called ROM that does the imputation after Quark. Quark and ROM are brothers, I guess. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so that's something that you can email me about. We'll have it available on our web page. We'd be happy to share you with, share that with you. We're also going to try to work on a SAS macro version of Quark. Yes? 
Just um, thinking about a lot of the sample sizes that are, happen a lot in, in smaller studies, is there some sort of way to do this in a manner that won't completely overwhelm your sample of 80 kids? Or well, one of, the, one of the nice things about pulling component scores mm -hmm. is you can have more variables than observations. Yeah. And so you can distill that down to a meaningful set of elements. Now, your sample size requirements for your ML estimator is still going to be something you're going to want to be a little bit more concerned about if you're going to use DIMMEL, but you can use MI with those component scores. Um, and actually, in a minute, I'm going to introduce you to an idea that I hope will blow your mind. <laughs> so I know people may be eager to ask questions, but let's let um, Todd have about 15 minutes, and then we'll open up to it. Okay, so the next topic is planned missing. Planned missing is probably the most un underutilized and yet potentially most powerful tool that we have available to us as a design feature. I love missing data. I really do. <laughs> My wife is a little bit jealous, but <laughs> that's all right. Missing data. When you start realizing the understanding the mechanisms of missing data that I had on the previous slide, that first mechanism right here, missing completely at random, that's a beautiful mechanism. When the data are missing completely at random, that means zero bias, right? You, the only thing that you lose when you have missing completely at random data is power. Modern approaches to treating missing data bring back the power. And because the data were missing completely at random, there was no recovery needed. It just brought back the power. So if I can somehow create a scenario where the data are missing completely at random, I have no loss. A modern approach will bring back the power. There's no, been no bias introduced. So why not start thinking about planning missing data? Because when I, as the experimenter, plan my missing data, which mechanism am I using? The missing completely at random mechanism. I'm controlling it. I'm making it a random process, a truly random process. Right. So one of the designs that we should be using in almost any questionnaire protocol is the multi-form approach. And the three-form version of this is the easiest in the world to utilize. It, it, there's no risk involved in using you, you still, um, you're capturing lots of variables from everybody. This is not an, this is like, you know, training wheels for mid plan missing data. If you use the three form missing data design, you're kind of getting, you know, getting the training wheels and learning how to bike. But I'll show you some aggressive versions of this that also will work. But it just needs to, it means you got to plan for it a little bit more and in the implementation, there's a little bit more logistics. You got to make sure that you are handling the logistics of giving the tools out to the right kids in a random process so that the mechanism is missing completely at random. Uh, so the particulars is you create four different variable sets and then you create three different forms of the questionnaire protocol from those variable sets. Form one will consist of X that everybody gets, the demographic information that you need to get from everybody, for example. But form one will only have those variables in set A and B, but not in C. Form two will have A and C, but not B. And the third form will have B and C, but not A. So each person is getting a short form. But in the end, when I collect up all the data, I have the long form. And the data that are missing are missing completely at random. <laughs> so what are some of the advantages? Well, here's an example here real quick. Uh, if I've got like the big five with multiple indicators, set A will take the first item from each of the big five, set B would have the second item, set C would have the third item. Here's form one, which is the X, A, B items. Here's another short form and here's another short form collect up all the data on the other hand and I have all the variables that I need with these data being missing completely random because they were controlled by me as to who didn't answer those particular questions. When I go through the modern approach to bring back the missing data, 
I'll get back in here the covariance structure, the mean structure that I would have had had I not had missing data. And in fact, I might actually get better data. How many of you have filled out a questionnaire in the last little while? Did you complete the questionnaire? <laughs> no, I abandoned it about maybe 10 minutes into it. Oh, there you go. So the data at the end of that, there, you know, there's a lot of missing data there that's missing not at random in the sense that it's not a controlled process. If I could give you a 10 minute questionnaire, you would have given me all the answers. Not only that, you're also going to see that it's only a 10 minute questionnaire, so your energy level, even for those 10 minutes, is probably going to be, you're going to be attending to it, you're going to be giving me a little bit more energy, thoughtfulness, like all of these things are going to give me more valid data than if I try to bombard you with this large protocol. The three forms missing data design is great if you already even have a shortage protocol. Make it shorter. Shorter is better, right? Short and sweet. If you've got a ton of data, go, go for a more aggressive design. This is the five variable set, 10 form. And here, I've got my demographics, and any one participant is only going to give me about two-fifths of the items. Any one participant is only going to give me two-fifths of the items. But after I get these 10 forms spread out randomly across Correct. And sample sizes go up. About 400 individuals is what I would need to make this one work. But many of you are already doing 400 sample sizes for longitudinal research to kids. Right? This would be a way to get that 10-minute questionnaire that really is a 40-minute questionnaire given in 10 minutes. And you can have unplanned missing data on top of that. There's still going to be people that aren't going to respond to certain items that they find sensitive. That's fine. These designs can handle that as well. The two method plan missing data design. This is going to be the mind blowing one. <laughs> this is now a way that we can actually utilize our knowledge of missing data mechanisms to our advantage. So, how many of you have been in a scenario where you've got this gold standard tool, you want to go out and collect data? but it costs too much money to get the big samples you need, right? So then you might resort to doing a self-report version of it or a teacher report version of it that's cheap. You can get the big samples, but you know it's biased. The two-method plan missing data design is a way you can have your cake and eat it too. So the idea here is everybody is going to get the cheap measure. So I'm going to get my big sample that I need. You're all going to get the cheap measure of whatever construct that we're interested in. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to randomly assign a subset of you to get my expensive measurements so that I can anchor the results where they need to be. Right? So stress. You got your spit samples, you measure the cortisol, and you do a simple stress survey. Or intelligence. Get your waist IQ interviews done. Right? And then John and I could sit down and create this most excellent multiple choice question of intelligence, give it out to everybody. We know it's biased, right? but it's going to correlate somewhat with intelligence, the actual measure. So now I can leverage the fact that the data that are missing are missing completely at random, and I can get a latent factor score on everybody, which is their true intelligence, by fitting a simple bifactor model with missing data. So I can fit it with the FIML estimate, or I can do MI. And what I get, so here's an example for smoking cessation. I got the blood draw on about one third of my sample that anchors the scores on this to be what these things are measuring. Whatever this is measuring, that's what this construct is. The sample size is built on this self-report tool that I ask people to tell me how much they smoked in the evening, how much they smoked on the weekend, during the weekdays, mornings, noon, a bunch of questions, and created parceled indicators of those items and pulled out a bias factor. This buy factor here, this is the bias that is involved in self-report. These loadings here are the same degree of information that these things are drawn from for those people where they overlap, meaning when they were missing completely at random, these scores are the same thing. So this becomes smoking cessation unbiased. 
or my full sample. Not only that, I have on my data set then a construct which is the degree to which you are willing to lie to me. It's true. Is that? Right? So I've got social desirability as a behavioral manifestation. I've got the best estimate of social desirability that I can use to now control social desirability out of my efficacy for quitting measure or my attitudes toward quitting measure to look at their real effect because those two are going to be contaminated with social desirability. So this is the power of latent variables as well. You can't do this as a manifest variable regression. There's no way you can do this except as a latent variable decomposition. And it also involves my second love, parceling. <laughs> Missing data and parceling, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number six, model your data. I think we still get hung up on some of the traditional ways of got to have that blind a priori null hypothesis. I, I have a colleague who says, you can't even look at your data. If you do, you got to dox some degrees of freedom for your test. Now, I'm going to model my data. I've generated these items. I'm a smart, reasonably smart, reasonably smart person, but I've got good colleagues who are very smart. And I'm going to rely on that, that we are going to interrogate our data. We're going to have a dialogue with our data. We're going to fit our model. We're going to evaluate all the parameter estimates. We're going to adjust those parameter estimates until we hone in on something that we think is going to be the best optimal rendition of what we think is going on. If we try to fit a priori and take our best guesses, we're going to continue to put out approximations of where we eventually wanted to get to in the first place. But if we interrogate our data and we model our data, we're going to put out something that I, as a consumer, am going to trust that a heck of a lot more than somebody who said, yes, we fit this model completely a priori and see how well it fits. Either they're lying to me or they've been able to go back in you know, the future and come back in time. So I don't know. Right? No. It's, but if they tell me, look, I interrogated my data. We work with it, and this is the final model we think is best. And we thought about each of those dual factor loadings and why they're there, and here's why we think that they're there. Or every residual that we correlated, here's why we think it's there. That we've really gotten to know the data before we start saying, here's the final model. But then part of this is we've got to have this dialogue, too. Right? You've got to take my final model, and if you don't like your, if it doesn't match your intuitions, I'm giving you the data. I need to give you the data so that you can fit your model. And let's have that discussion. That process is going to be far more fruitful than this kind of blind process that often is dictating how we put our research questions out there. Finally, number seven, the randomized clinical trial. We've gotten so hung up on using, utilizing that particular tool as the one way that we can demonstrate anything we really have lost sight that there are many other techniques out there that are just as good. Right? This is a picture of Tom Cook at a, at a retreat. And I got blown away here because usually when you start thinking about the regression discontinuity design, it's a beautiful design for treating those people who need to be treated. Right? You've got a cut score. You're giving the people that are the most needy their, their treatment. But the RDD design is typically underpowered compared to the RCT. Right? And technically speaking, you can only generalize to those people at the cut point. You can't generalize beyond the cut point. Well, Tom says, well, oh, yeah, all you need is just a comparison function. And voila, the same power as the RCT, and you can generalize the whole spectrum. Another book. <laughs> Another design that we've been working with that has not caught on, for intervention research in particular, is the retrospective pre-post design. How many of you have done an intervention looking at trying to change some attitudes or some beliefs, right? And you get no difference between pre and post. And yet, 
you're talking to the people, your focus groups are saying, my God, this is the greatest intervention since Swiss cheese. You know, it's like, it's, it's great stuff, I get it. It's, it's, problem is, pre-test, their mindset was different. Post-test, now they realize that they had a problem. And now, but the scores are exactly the same. The retrospective pre-post design allows you to calibrate and estimate that response shift bias. Right? So if you say, at, before the study began, where were you? Now they're going to say, oh man, I was really, I was bad off. And I denied it pre-test, but now I realize I was bad off. That's your response shift bias. And now we can start seeing the effectiveness of our interventions by using a retrospective pre-post design and calibrating how much response shift bias there would be. These techniques work really well for attitudes, beliefs, but they don't work for skills or knowledge. I can't go back and think, well, you know, I knew 10 things last week. That doesn't work. Right? So if you're going to calibrate it, if it's a knowledge-based intervention, you've got to do the pre-post. But for attitudes and beliefs, anything in that direction, that response shift bias is very palatable. This is a great technique for, for, for doing that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. So um, we got a, a late start, so I'm especially pleased that you ended when you did. It'll allow uh, extra time for uh, some questions and answers. So let me just go ahead and open open it up. Yes. Uh, you, when you were at the very beginning, when you're talking about research versus research, and you're looking at people who are experts in the field versus people who are experts in the methodology, I was wondering where perhaps a naive critic might fit in, somebody who can understand potentially but is not an expert in either one. Uh, most doctoral uh, committees have at least one faculty member from some other department to serve as the unbiased critic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I think as you start, the, the simplest model is the, the methodologically savvy and the theoretically savvy. But when you start thinking about teams and creating research, if you think about a football team, not everybody's a quarterback. Right? Everybody has a role to play. Yeah, but in the football team, everybody knows the rules. Yeah. Well, yeah. But I think, uh, <laughs> you assume. You assume. So maybe, we'll, maybe we'll play a little bit of uh, Australian rules or something. Like that. <laughs> but no, I think that th those kinds of things will come to play. And, and hopefully you're not just a, a naive critic that has no ability to speak to the people that are on the committee. Because they should be calling to the committee. And you should be able to say... Oh, okay, yeah, I know where you're coming from. I understand your theory. Well, what have you thought about this? Because that's just good, good collegial crit critiques. We need that. Yeah. Right. The other thing we should be sure to do is we will restate the question because this is being live streamed and people from across the state are also My apologies. watching it. No, 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 no we sh I, I should have mentioned. Gentlemen. Yes. Uh, I'm very interested in hearing your thoughts on uh, hypothesis testing, especially related to the journal of psychology that banned hypothesis testing since June. Yeah, so the question is, what, what do I think about hypothesis testing? This is public, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm not a fan. I think, I think there's a time and a place for it, but that time and place is not every research question every day. It's going to be, maybe I'm going to follow up on a nuance in my model that I really need to maybe understand, and maybe a hypothesis testing approach there might work. But the principles of hypothesis testing, we can all live by, right? I'm trying to balance type 1 and type 2 error in every decision that I make, whether it's what I'm going to eat this morning for breakfast or whether it's the analysis that I'm going to be doing for this model. So figuring out some of those things to say where's going to be that best balance of error is an important consideration. But the blind hypothesis testing approach generally I don't think is going to be as fruitful for us anymore. They, they, I think it's grabbed most of the low-hanging fruit that it can grab. Really, breakfast? <laughs> Brian. Brian. So, what's your uh, opinion of, of uh, p values then? Oh, yeah, this is called the slippery slope. Yeah, is, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so, what is my opinion of p values, right? So, it's, it's a very similar issue with the p values. We need to be thinking about effect sizes. And moreover, we need to be thinking, what are the implications of an effect size? So maybe a 0.1 
a 0.14 effect size. What does that mean in terms of the number of individuals for whom this thing does x? Right, can we come up with ways of thinking about that? Because then the p-value is how many people, and that's something we can all say, well, that's enough for me to say, let's put some money into it. Okay. Great. Another question? Yes, Lee. I've been warned against using the regression discontinuity design because you lose so much power. How do you come to that? Yeah, so the, the traditional regression discontinuity line is uh, d design is an underpowered tool, but as I mentioned, the comparison function gets back all of that power loss. So it's just as powerful as the RCT if you include the comparison function. Is there a complication so, on that? Uh, yes. Well, at the time that Tom was presenting it, I think he had something that is, it should be out now. And I don't think he's first author on it, but it's it's a paper coming out of Tom Post. Big brain. <laughs> I agree. Another question. Bridget, go for it. Um, so thinking about, well, a lot of different things here, but um, when you're designing a study and you put and you get uh, uh, alluded to this at the very beginning, but it's really hard to convince reviewers that, I mean, I've thought about using the plain missing yes for saliva samples numerous times, and they freak out. I mean, just just on a most recent paper, they this reviewer had an argument with me about the effect size and the p-value, because one was good and one was not so good. And so when you're thinking about trying to get papers published, which is still a, you know, a track, what are maybe two big pieces of advice or strategies that um, we could use? Yeah, uh, so what are a couple strategies and advice for battling the fudsies? <laughs> <laughs> We're in this for a marathon. It's a long way. And so collaborations, getting good collaborators, get those things out there and stick to your guns. You've got, you are going to change the field. The white-haired old parts like me are just going to get in your way, right? You got to, you got to be willing to bowl your way past that conflict. And if you do, then that's what's going to change the field. And hopefully you'll get a few of the old parts like me kind of being on your side. <laughs> I'd actually like to take this opportunity to invite anyone watching online to uh, pose a question. Is that any? No, we're okay. Okay? We don't need to worry about that. Um, another question. We've got a few more minutes yet. John? So what do you think about combining the effect size approach and the hypothesis testing approach by creating, say, confidence interval around the effect size? That way, when you have a, a p-value of 0.2, you see that the, the point estimate of the effect size is pretty big, but you still, it still conveys the idea that the effect size is still maybe zero. Right, so it, uh, con combining things, I, I'm a big advocate for confidence intervals, as well as confidence intervals based on bootstrap estimation, because they shouldn't necessarily be symmetrical. Right? And, you know, but should we, you know, put a magical marker of 05 or 01? Again, we're trying to balance our error rates to say, is that effect size meaningful? Because it could possibly be zero. Mm -hmm. right, so we do need to do a bit of that, but not the traditional p-value approach with symmetrical confidence. But you know, a lot of the missing data stuff is to get back more precision so that when I do get that effect size, at some point with my sample sizes being as big as they are, the effect size is going to drive the decision. It's either big enough or it's not. It makes a difference. One last question. Okay, I'll put. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in order, since this is all basically trying to uh, determine policy, is there any attempt right now going on to educate legislators about these new approaches? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so is there any movement to educate the legislators on these new approaches? Um, I don't know. If Carolyn, Carolyn is here. So we were talking a little bit about. Um, I am a big advocate to do the test in the appropriate way, but then figure out, maybe we'll do a dichotomy and show the two means. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to put p-values around it, because that was based on the sophisticated. So you've still got to be able to bring it to the level that the legislator is going to understand. But if we focus on 
effect sizes and translating those effect sizes into the number of people for whom this will change their lives, then a legislator will bite. Well, uh, a big, warm round of applause for today. invite you, uh, we do invite you, not would, <laughs> we, we invite you now to uh, to uh, join us in, in the lobby. There are still uh, hors d'oeuvres there and uh, coffee and soft drinks. Uh, please socialize uh, in, in the group and with Todd. Um, and then at 2 o'clock, 1.30, 1 .30, 1 .30, uh, the, there will be a special session with uh, graduate students in the college, in this room as well. Okay? Or as soon as, I mean, 1.15 to 1.30. Yeah. Um, and then finally, if you're interested in reading the one wish essay that, uh, that Todd wrote, you can go to Research and Human Development. All of the contents of that double issue are online and, for, and free through the end of December. Okay? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.